The year is 1509 CE, and the Vijayanagara Empire is recovering from a half century of war and instability. An era of unprecedented prosperity and opportunity awaits. But while Vijayanagara stands on the precipice of historical greatness, unexpected challenges threaten to rip the empire apart at the seams. Back in the capital, Emperor Veeranarsama is dying of a mysterious illness. A replacement must be chosen, and fast. Enter Krishnadevaraya, otherwise known as KDR, half-brother of the sickly emperor. Capable, clever, and proven, KDR is the logical choice. But Veeranarsama has other plans. He intends for his own eight-year-old son to inherit the empire. Besides, KDR isn't fit for the throne. No. As the unplanned love child of a lowly servant woman, his royal blood has been diluted to the point of illegitimacy. In theory, though KDR is an outcast prince, his wit and charisma have earned him many powerful allies, most notably the Prime Minister Timurasu, who has been preparing him for years to ascend the Lion Throne. And so when the Emperor orders that KDR be blinded to prevent his enthronement, the Prime Minister hatches a clever alternative plan. Hmm. Timurasu slaughters a goat and takes the eyes to the dying Emperor and the eyes are sufficiently human-like to fool the emperor. Vira Narsama breathes a sigh of relief and dies, falsely believing that his son will inherit the empire as intended. But Timurasu oh. sets his own plan in motion. He crowns KDR as the new emperor of Vijayanagar. The enterprising KDR is determined to lead the empire to glory, but dangerous enemies lie in wait for an opportunity to strike. To the east, the arrogant Gajapati king fumes at the prospect of having to engage with Vijayanagara leadership, whom he considers to be low-caste mongrels. His hatred is a powder keg ready to explode. To the north, the Bamani Sultanate has splintered into five smaller Deccan Sultanates. In the chaos, a number of ambitious foreigners grapple for control, and to the west, the Portuguese are beginning to assert themselves. Welcome to the pulsing heart of medieval India. When KDR ascended the Lion Throne, the Vijayanagar Empire was nearly 200 years old and enjoyed a long and storied history. From the very beginning, sages spoke reverently about the empire and its destiny. It was always meant to be something more, something different than the stagnancy and divisiveness of the past. Let's travel back to the early 14th century for a quick recap. By 1310 CE, the Sultan in Delhi, Alauddin Khilji, Having heard stories of the prosperous south, he sent the Gujarati eunuch Malik Kafur, his trusted slave commander and lover, to conquer the peninsula. Malik Kafur was a brilliant militarist and had an overwhelming numbers advantage. In just a few short years, he swept through most of South India and toppled its major dynastic powers. The Deccan and the rest of South India was left shattered. In the wake of this invasion, Bukka and Harihara, two brothers who had served in the Kakatiya court, found themselves prisoner to the Sultan in Delhi. Wow. Though controversial, it appears that the two brothers converted to Islam in an attempt to curry political favor with the Sultan. Alauddin Khilji rewarded them with the governorship in their native land. But when they returned to the Southern Deccan, they began to reconsider their new allegiances. Hmm. The two brothers encountered a respected Hindu sage who showed them a promising vision of the future. They were destined to establish a legendary empire and lead a unified fight against Turkic forces. Bukka and Harihara immediately converted back to Hinduism and, going on a militarized tour of South India, carved out the beginnings of the Vijayanagar Empire in 1336 CE. Vijayanagar thrived for more than a century under the Sangama lineage, and though the empire began as a local Hindu bastion, it eventually grew into a multi-ethnic, multi-religious powerhouse. For example, under Emperor Devaraya II in the early 15th century, Muslim immigrants were welcomed into the empire and given titles, lands, and choice positions within the imperial administration. If that wasn't surprising enough, Devaraya II's daughter was married to the Bamani Sultan, Feroz Shah. Social customs, music, and even clothing were changing to reflect the incredible diversity of the empire. Under the Sangama dynasty, the capital of Vijayanagar became the second largest city in the world, trailing only Beijing and ahead of Paris. Many different communities called the city their home. People from throughout India, of course, but also Venetian merchants, Persian diplomats, Malay sailors, Chinese engineers, and Ethiopian mercenaries. The empire grew and prospered, but dynastic squabbling characterized the latter half of the 15th century. 
After a Red Wedding-esque murder plan by Devereya II's brother to claim the throne, the empire sank into chaos. The Bomini Sultanate and the Gujarpati Kingdom invaded simultaneously, chipping away at the borderlands and destabilizing feudal networks. This was followed by an oral-obsessed emperor who ignored his royal duties. And so came the first dynastic change in the empire's long history, the Sulavas, a desperate attempt to salvage a grand, deteriorating power. But the bleeding continued. The Gajapati kingdom was now firmly entrenched in the Krishna River Delta, and the Bamani Sultanate raided the empire indiscriminately. Enter Narasa Nayaka, the father of KDR, and the founder of the third Vijayanagar dynasty, the Tuluvas. Narasa Nayaka did not engage in any fakery regarding his caste. He was a proud Shudra warlord who had attained the rank of general and subsequently forced himself upon the throne. His efforts stabilized the Vijayanagar Empire, though it continued to be exposed to conflicts both without and within. In 1504 CE, leadership fell to his son Viranarsama, and in 1509 CE, the throne finally passed to our enterprising friend KDR, who would mold the Vijayanagar Empire into one of the greatest in Indian history. KDR developed a reputation as a man of many dualities, short-tempered and kind, courageous and scholarly, rational and impulsive. He was also a man who was willing to act in defiance of tradition. To understand, let's explore his Bollywood-esque love story. In the early years of his reign, KDR performed intelligence gathering on his own. Come nightfall, after his official duties were complete, he would disguise himself as a commoner and would slip out of the palace under the cover of darkness, roaming the busy streets of Vijayanagar and interacting with its residents. But getting his finger on the pulse of the empire was not the only goal of these reconnaissance missions. In truth, the newly crowned emperor would spend many of his nights meeting the beautiful courtesan Chinnadevi. Their connection had been established long before his enthronement. According to the Portuguese chronicler Nunes, when KDR was growing up in the capital, he developed a secret relationship with Chinnadevi. His affection for her was so great that he promised marriage should he win the throne. But she was nothing more than a low caste dancing girl from Telugu country. And so KDR could not formally take her on as his wife. His many promises to her could not be realized, or so one would think. One evening, when KDR was in disguise and on his way to Chidamdevi's house, he was discovered by his prime minister, Timurasu, who had quietly followed him out of the palace. Hey! Timurasu rebuked the young emperor and they walked back to the palace together. Mm -hmm. But during this walk and talk, KDR was not shy about his thoughts and feelings towards Chidamdevi. He disclosed everything, including the marriage promise that he fully intended to honor. When Timurasu told KDR that such a marriage would not be possible, the young emperor stood his ground and proclaimed that he would sooner give up the throne than Chinnadevi. Timurasu reflected on the situation at hand. Hmm. See, Timurasu was much more than an advisor. He was a father figure who had in many ways raised KDR, and for this he was affectionately called Appaji. And so a compromise solution was drawn up. Timurasu agreed to marry KDR to Chinnadevi in secret, but first the young emperor would have to take the Mysorean princess Thirumala Devi as his principal queen. This would resolve ongoing political conflicts in the southernmost territories and ensure that at least one of his marriages was seen as legitimate. KDR was passionate, yes, but capable of compromise. He married Thirumala Devi first and then quietly wed Chinnadevi in a forest on the outskirts of the capital. And though she was his second wife and could not give him royal heirs, Chinnadevi was KDR's true love till the end of his life, his favored queen. This duality of passion and practicality, of defiance and tradition, would not just play out in his romantic life. As a prolific writer, KDR expressed these and other dualities in verse. In his masterpiece work, Amukta Malyara, KDR describes medieval India as politically deteriorated, teeming with self-serving lords and greedy bureaucrats. As such, even his commitment to the traditional ideal of a righteous king was a form of defiance, a full-throated challenge to the corrupt elites of his era. According to Domingo Pace, who interacted with KDR and lived in Vijayanagar for a time, he was the most feared and perfect king that could possibly be, cheerful of disposition and very merry. He is a great ruler and a man of much justice, but subject to sudden fits of rage. And he gives, not out of formality, but as a token of friendship and love. Before taking the throne, KDR had proven a brilliant commander. He was undefeated, in fact. And so it was expected that he would exercise great skill in leading the military. This prediction would prove remarkably accurate. 
After a reconfiguring of tax and military assessments, KDR's treasury was full and his armies replenished. Withholding lords were punished and brought to heel. KDR now had the resources to flex his military strength and to maintain and expand the empire's borders. Thus began the first of many expeditions, this one against an uprising by the Gangaraja of Umatur. KDR dispatched a small but well-equipped force to the area. His armies then surrounded the fortress and suffocated its supply lines. No. After a year had passed, the Gangaraja surrendered and the revolt was quelled. Following this victory, KDR entered into a marriage alliance with the defeated Gangaraja's daughter, Thirmala Devi, and toured the southern regions. With the southern country stabilized, KDR could turn his attention fully to the north. By the early 1500s, the Bamani Sultanate had collapsed, dividing into five independent successor dynasties. KDR sought to weaken these neighboring powers by playing them against one another in an ever-shifting game of alliances, and by engaging in some good old-fashioned warfare. And so, when, in 1511 CE, Vijayanagar spies reported that the Bijapuri Sultan Yusuf Adil Shah had used insolent words to describe KDR, the famously short-tempered and impulsive emperor felt that this was sufficient justification for war, though some sources indicate that there was pre-existing bad blood. Decades prior, Yusuf Adil Shah had feigned peace with KDR's father and invited him to an outdoor event. At this event, the Adil Shah then suddenly betrayed Narasanaka's trust and attacked him, nearly killing him and his entourage of nobles. KDR was furious at this audacious behavior and decided to punish the Bijapuri Sultan for his many transgressions. He brought his armies to meet Yusuf Adil Shah and his allies by the banks of the Krishna River. On the advice of the influential Telugu lord Ramalingama Naidu, KDR sent out a detachment of Kamma warriors to sow discord among the Bijapuri ranks and to cut the ropes of their symbolic battle tent. The Kamma detachment rushed towards the battle tent, around which the allied sultans had mobilized their infantry, cavalry, and elephant corps. But as Ramalingama and his men approached the enemy forces, they suddenly dismounted from their horses and leapt onto the backs of the Sultan's elephants. The acrobatic Kamo warriors sliced at the elephants' trunks and skewered the mahouts. This caused the maddened elephants to lose control, trampling on their allies and disrupting their defenses. In the midst of this bloody chaos, Ramalingama snuck his way into the battle tent, cut the ropes, and collapsed it. Just like that, the morale of the enemy was broken. Kidiara sounded the battle drums and mounted his own elephant, charging in with the rest of the Vijayanagar forces. Bijapuri forces began to retreat to the other side of the Krishna River, but at that moment, the water swelled. The Bijapuris and their allies panicked and jumped headlong into the swirling river. Many of them drowned. Others, mostly nobles and officers, dismounted and got into boats which allowed them to make their way across the river safely. At some point during this river retreat, Kidiara personally slew Yusuf Adil Shah Hail Krishnaraya! With a fierce and unified attack, you crushed the skulls of Persian warriors like melons, and built a gruesome effigy with the Adil Khan's head. He ordered that his men go forth into Bijapuri territory and pillage the land, bringing great devastation upon the Sultanate and its people. KDR returned to the palace in a restless state, and so he turned to the imperial diaries of his predecessors for guidance. The diaries of former emperor Salva Narsama left a particularly strong impression on KDR. See, Narsama identified three fortresses that were necessary to ensure the empire's continued prosperity and safety, Raichur, Mudgal, and Udayagiri. Capturing these forts became KDR's next goal. Quick note, despite these grand military aspirations, KDR remained a disciplined administrator who, as Portuguese and Persian writers point out, was deeply engaged in all affairs of the state. Udayagiri Fort was first up, and it would have to be taken back from the arrogant ruler of the Gajapati kingdom of Orissa, Prataparudradeva. Prataparudradeva ruled over a vast stretch of land, with the southern territories of his kingdom encompassing the Krishna River Delta and further down, formerly belonging to Vijayanagara. But this wasn't just some ordinary piece of territory. It was arguably the most agro-rich region in the subcontinent, and therefore a point of serious contention. The thing is, he also seethed with an intense hatred for KDR. One simple issue fueled this animosity, caste. See, Prataparudradeva was born a Kshatriya, and there was no question as to his innate right to kingship. Meanwhile, KDR was born to a Shudra father and a lowly servant mother. Narasanayaka's rise to power as an army commander and KDR's own enthronement makes it clear that caste occupation in South India was fluid, 
But in other parts of India, there were limits on that fluidity. Some, like the high-born Prataparudradeva, saw KDR as a low-born usurper of the southern throne. In fact, Prataparudradeva was so arrogant that he deemed it below his social standing to engage at all with KDR, and referred to him by the insulting epithet Dasiputra, or son of a servant girl. And so KDR salivated at the prospect of not only winning back old territories, but also proving himself superior to the high caste Prataparudradeva. Soon enough, he launched a campaign against the Gajapati kingdom, starting with the Andhra territories that were taken from Vijayanagar decades before. As KDR slow rolled through Andhra, he built alliances with local lords who had sworn fealty to the Gajapati kingdom. He convinced them to peacefully rejoin the Vijayanagar empire. The remaining holdouts, the fortress cities of Udegiri, Kondaviru, and Kondapali, were sieged and eventually conquered. Notably, Prataparudradeva himself attempted to break the siege of Kondaviru with a large Gajapati force, but the battle ended in a provisional victory for KDR. The brave warrior caste Prataparudradeva fled for safety, leaving his son, Prince Virabhadra, stuck in the fort. The prince was captured and became KDR's prisoner. According to the historical record, KDR visited the captured prince in an effort to be amicable. As the prince was renowned for his swordsmanship, KDR asked if he could demonstrate his skill by sparring with one of Vijayanagar's own expert swordsmen. The prince was aghast. See, the Vijayanagar swordsman was a man of humble birth. Prince Virabhadra was so insulted that he grabbed a dagger from the belt of the nearby guard and plunged it into his own heart, apparently a preferable outcome to sparring with a low caste warrior. All this caste hatred shook KDR to his core. He was not satisfied with merely taking back Andhra. No, no, no. He wanted to punish Prataparudradeva and his family for their arrogance. Though Temurasu advised him against it, he prepared for an invasion of Orissa. Again, diplomacy and cleverness won the day. With the help of Timurasu, a cunning ploy was devised. To create paranoia, KDR sent a chest full of treasure to each of Prataparudradeva's most loyal Orissa lords, thanking them for rendering service to the Vijayanagar Empire. As expected, the chests were discovered by Prataparudradeva's spies, who thought that they'd uncovered a rebel plot. Prataparudradeva was tricked. He falsely believed that his lords had turned against him, and so he fled from his capital in the middle of the night. <gasps> KDR marched on Katak and conquered the Gajapati kingdom, but chose not to assimilate it into his own empire. No. Instead, he brokered a peace deal with the Orissa lords and entered yet another marriage alliance, this time with Prataparudradeva's daughter, who he allowed to remain in her homeland. And so the Gajapati kingdom was left as a weakened buffer state. KDR, still undefeated, brimmed with victorious energy. After the Gajapati campaign, KDR returned to the task of imperial governance. But despite his many administrative successes, a thriving economy, a South Indian cultural golden age, peace and stability in the provinces, he could not set aside his military ambitions. Both the Mugdal and Udayagiri forts may have been recaptured, but Raichur remained in the possession of the Bijapur Sultanate. By taking the Raichur Dab, the empire would reach the apex of its glory, and KDR's legacy would be cemented. But in medieval India, war could not be waged without ample justification, so KDR concocted a rather brilliant plan. Hmm. He sent one of his trusted royal officers, a Muslim named Sidi Merkar, to Goa with an enormous sum of money in order to buy horses from the Portuguese. As per their secret plan, Sidi defected and took asylum under Ismail Adil Shah of Bijapur. Sidi's fake defection was followed by a friendly letter from KDR, requesting that the Adil Shah extradite the officer back to Vijayanagar so that he could be punished in accordance with a pre-existing treaty. As expected, Ismail Adil Shah refused to return Sidi no. in an attempt to assert his political authority. KDR and the double agent Sidi must have been quite pleased with themselves. Vijayanagar now had sufficient justification to go to war and take back Raichur. KDR marched on Raichur and sent letters to the four other Deccan sultans explaining the situation. He received the blessing of the other sultans. They agreed that he was in the right and even offered to assist. Raichur was a coveted hilltop stronghold with three layers of heavy masonry. With their massive slabs of finely dressed granite, these walls were, in their own day, considered an engineering marvel. It was also well provisioned. Atop the hill was a spring which flowed with fresh water. The garrison could withstand a siege for as much as five years. 
From a weapons perspective, the fort was equipped with heavy catapults, 200 pieces of heavy artillery, and hundreds of pieces of light artillery. Matchlock infantrymen patrolled the walls at all times. Although KDR had his own cannons, he chose not to deploy them in penetrating the rampart walls. No. Instead, he engaged a regiment of his Muslim soldiers to lead the vanguard in dismantling the outer wall with pickaxes. These soldiers were given cash incentives for each stone they pried from the wall, ensuring that this difficult, bloody work would continue despite heavy casualties. In approaching the wall, many lost their lives due to defensive cannon and musket fire. This continued for three long months. Finally, in the summer of 1520 CE, Ismail Adil Shah arrived from Bijapur with a formidable army and thousands of artillery pieces. He encamped on the north bank of the river. The arrival of Ismail Adil Shah forced KDR to turn his attention away from sieging the fort and towards the encamped Bijapuri forces. There are a few different narratives describing the battle. One narrative by the Persian writer Farishta explains that Ismail Adil Shah had partied so hard before the battle that he mounted his elephant in a drunken stupor and ordered his men to cross the river on rafts. Ismail Adil Shah plunged his own elephant into the river and led his troops towards the Vijayanagar forces, who slaughtered the vulnerable Bijapuris easily. But the Portuguese narrative is believed to be more accurate and it makes no mention of inebriation. Instead, the Bijapuri forces under Ismail Adil Shah are said to have crossed the river at first light on a Saturday morning. KDR immediately ordered that his own forces advance to meet the enemy. Since there was only one small ford by which to cross, soldiers on both sides were forced to funnel into a narrow strip of the flowing river. Ismail Adil Shah planned for this exact scenario. Using his advanced gunpowder weaponry, he ordered a relentless barrage of musket fire and cannon fire onto the funneling armies. Vijayanagar soldiers were slaughtered en masse. All this carnage caused confusion among the Vijayanagar troops. Ismail Adil Shah used the opportunity to charge in with his elephants and cavalry. Shocked and disrupted by the Adil Shah's maneuver, the Vijayanagar army began to flee. When KDR saw his men fleeing, he rode out before his ranks and shouted, We all die one day, one way or another. Let us meet fate boldly and find death in battle like our heroic fathers. The Adil Shah may boast that he has slain the greatest lord in the world, but never that he vanquished him. KDR then took a ring from his finger and passed it to one of his pages so that it could be shown to his queens as a token of his death. He turned again to his armies and reared his steed. Now, who ranges himself with me? With this rallying call, KDR charged into the breach and his captains, inspired by the fearlessness of their emperor, joined his side. This rallying cry changed the tides of battle, as the Bijaporis did not expect the Vijayanagar forces to regroup so quickly, and so the surprised Bijapuri troops broke rank and were in disarray, many of them leaping into the river to save themselves, while others were torn into pieces by KDR's war elephants. The scene was gruesome and bloody. Drowning soldiers, mutilated bodies, directionless animals. In the midst of all this, a Bijapuri lord, Asada Khan, sensed imminent defeat and rallied to the Sultan. He shouted, Sire, if you wish to live, follow me. Then he lifted Ismail Adil Shah onto an elephant and helped him escape. Whether out of compassion or not, KDR commanded his troops to stand down no. and allowed the Bijapuris to flee for safety. Then he crossed the river and marched into Ismail Adil Shah's abandoned camp. But instead of pursuing his enemies further, KDR committed to capturing Raichur Fort quickly. Too many who were not to blame have died here today. If the Adil Shah has done me wrong, he has suffered enough. He returned to his original siege positions, but the previous strategy, using pickaxes and crowbars, wasn't quite working. How fortuitous then, that KDR was soon greeted by a Portuguese nobleman and his band of 20 sharpshooters. This group of foreigners was on their way to Vijayanagar to sell horses. Always the gregarious and curious host, KDR welcomed the Portuguese noble, a man named Cristóval de Figueiredo, and gave him tents close to his own quarters. KDR took much pleasure in meeting these foreigners. They became fast friends. Then one day, Cristóval asked to see the fort more closely so that he could better understand the siege. Cristóval explained, The whole business of the Portuguese is war. Letting me go would be the greatest favor that you could do upon me. KDR sent some soldiers to accompany Cristóval to the siege trenches. Cristóval discovered a glaring weakness. The fort defenders moved freely along the ramparts. See, the defenders had never faced a weapon that could reach far enough to hit them, but it just so happened that Cristóval had that weapon in his possession. Meet the Indo-Portuguese matchlock rifle, 
an innovative combination of Turkic, Portuguese, and Goan Indian engineering and craftsmanship. With these new long-distance, high-precision weapons, Cristoval and his snipers could pick off the defenders with ease. Cristoval split his musketeers into three companies and popped any defender who dared show himself at the ramparts. Once again, KDR sent his soldiers with pickaxes and crowbars to break down the walls, but this time, the cover provided by Cristoval's men meant that the work would go unharassed. Frustrated and confused, the Bijapuri captain of the city briefly stuck his head out above the parapet to assess the situation, revealing himself. Cristoval himself sent a musket shot screaming through the captain's skull. The very next day, the fortress was surrendered. No civilians were killed, and KDR even gave provisions to those who wished to leave the city. With this victory, KDR had established himself as the most powerful leader in the subcontinent, and one of the most powerful in the world. He returned to Vijayanagar bolder than ever. In the wake of the Raichur campaign, KDR spent most of his time and energy on managing his extensive empire. He completed many public works projects, built new cities and markets and temples and gardens, and successfully navigated both political and economic challenges. Vijayanagar was stable, and it grew more and more prosperous by the day, but KDR made two mistakes that set the stage for Vijayanagar's later collapse. Number one. After his defeat at Raichur, the Adil Shah dispatched his ambassador to negotiate a settlement. The ambassador's exchange with KDR was recorded as follows. My master believes you to be the most powerful king in all the world, and one possessed of much justice. But since you broke the peace without reason, he requests that you return his artillery and tents, his horses and elephants, and his city of Raichur. KDR replied, I would be happy to return everything to the Adil Shah, under one condition he must come here and kiss my foot. Ismail, upon receiving this message, jokingly responded that he would be willing to kiss KDR's foot, but he could not do so since it was impossible to enter enemy territory. KDR flew into a sudden fit of rage, perhaps because it was unreasonable for the Adil Shah to make such a bold initial settlement request anyways. He swept through the enemy kingdom and plundered several of its major cities. Finally, he arrived in the old Bamani capital of Gulbarga, there he found the imprisoned descendants of the former sultan. Hoping to play kingmaker, he raised up the eldest son onto the throne as a puppet. This move gave the other Deccan sultans pause. KDR proved that he was willing to interfere with their internal politics and destabilize them. And in doing so, he made the Vijayanagar Empire a target for all the sultanates. Number 2. In 1523 CE, when KDR was in his late 40s, he began the succession process early by handing over the reins of power to his young son, Thirumalaraya. This move was necessitated due to the threat posed by his scheming son-in-law, Ramaraya, who wished to take the throne for himself, and so KDR crowned his son while making himself the prime minister. Thus, he could provide guidance as his son grew into the role. But during the eight-month period before the official coronation, the crown prince fell ill and died, likely of poisoning, and suddenly accusations were being hurled at KDR's beloved Timurasu. KDR was inconsolable. Instead of considering the accusations more carefully, he accepted that Timurasu was to blame. He imprisoned Timurasu and several of his family members, all of whom were politically influential, and blinded the old minister with an iron rod. Big mistake. For in the end, it appears that Timurasu was innocent, According to popular accounts, it was Ramaraya who was responsible for both poisoning the boy and starting the false accusations. With a dwindling number of loyalists in his court, and without a well-trained heir to fill the power vacuum, KDR was not equipped to prevent a Ramaraya takeover after his death. And so when KDR died in 1529 CE, he left behind an astounding legacy and a grand empire, but one that was doomed to collapse. And now you know. If you'd like to learn more about the Vijayanagar Empire in general, I have an older video that covers the entire empire, and it also has a few fun little details about things like KDR's workout regimen. So check it out.